Well, for more on this topic, we're joined by Sarhan Hatapolu, CGTN's Global Economics Analyst. Welcome back to the show. Pleasure to be here, Rochelle. So as we saw, the reformist Zhou Xiaochuan says China really needs to take bolder steps with its reforms. What do you expect on that front, especially as he prepares to step down? Well, yes, 15 years is a long time, and he's done a very good job, and he's taken some of these bold steps himself, but more needs to be done, and he acknowledged that today. Uh, one of the issues that uh, they have been talking about is certainly more market access, given more market access to foreign companies that are coming in, which has started with the financial industry uh, late last year. Also, capital account convertibility. This is very important because China is trying to move its currency to, be, to become a global currency, and therefore it needs liquidity. So these are the main bold reforms that uh, he's been talking about. But there's also ways of looking at monetary policy. For example, Premier Li on Monday uh, did not use M2, broad money supply, in its interpretation of inflation. So they're looking at output. They're looking at different um, uh, data because they know that uh, just M2 now is not enough to see whether the monetary policy is expansionary or not. Now, something else that they're looking at is this stance on Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Now, they see the value in the blockchain technology, but not the market speculation that it, that it tends to drive. How do you see China incorporating this going forward? Very slowly, at a very measured pace, as it has been doing with other reforms that it has introduced. And I liked I liked when I heard that blockchain technology for China is here to stay. They seem to understand what's going on. There are hawks and there are doves in terms of countries regarding Bitcoin. China is on the hawkish side, together with Russia, for example, South Korea. But there are the doves, like the UK, uh, like Canada. They're looking at, uh, they, they're saying more needs to be studied here. But look, if you're a government person in charge of monetary policy, I would be worried too, not only because I have to protect investors from my country, because some of these are fraud, not all of them, some of them, but also um, I, I run the currency. There's, there's a challenger here. I need to understand this. So that's what China is doing. Certainly a, a new landscape everyone's trying to get used to. Now, we also heard uh, Joe say that China's prudent monetary policy is to remain neutral in 2018. Help us understand how we can see that reflected. So when they say neutral, it's prudent monetary policy. Uh, that to me means that we're no longer going to engage in expansionary monetary policy to um, flush the market with credit to support economic growth. What we're going to be doing now is what China is saying. We're going to look at financial excesses. We're going to try to get rid of this. And the economic growth will come from elsewhere. And I think that's a good sign. But it hasn't started today or last week. If you look at the 2017 numbers, interbank assets and liabilities contracted for the first time in seven years. So uh, this, this process is underway. And are there any factors in the economy that you think perhaps might make them change course? If there is a big external shock, absolutely. If uh, the transition from, the transition has been going well, but there could be roadblocks in there. China has a very complicated monetary policy mix. It's not, it used to depend on interest rates, but it has a lot of tools now. As a medium-term lending facility, short-term lending facility, um, temporary liquidity facility, reserve ratios. So uh, they will use if they need to use this. But what I've heard today, and what I've been hearing for a while, actually, is that they're not going to immediately go there and support the economy at this point. And how do you see the current course that they're taking impacting its growth target of 6.5% for the year? I think it's good because what, what they're saying is, look, we're not going to do this, but we have other things. Consumption is doing well in China. There's, there could be targeted infrastructure projects. That's OK, too. Um, China has moved from being a growth country to a value country. Now, I think investors need to understand that. That's a stock market analogy here. But if you look at China's growth rate to decide whether you should engage in China or not, I think you're behind the curve here. China has moved on. Now they're talking about AI, uh, getting AI output and related industries to $1.5 trillion, one-tenth of its economy in 2030. China has become a value uh, country, and I think the measures that the, the monetary policy measures that have been announced today will help China get there. And what do you see as the top policy priorities for the PBOC for 2018? I think they need to really go after financial excesses. They have been doing a good job. They need to accelerate it. And everything I heard this week told me that they are going after that. Look, we have significant uh, debt to GDP ratio, significant uh, household debts in, in China, and online financial companies. Now, they're getting there, and they're providing loans. And a lot of the times, Chinese consumers are borrowing those loans online to pay existing loans. So this needs to be stopped. And I think there are good um, signs that I'm seeing 
that uh, China is getting there. And what do you think will be the most encouraging signs that investors heard out of these announcements? I think the determination, because they've looked back in the past too. When a decision came uh, from either monetary policy or the government in China, they went after that. Corruption is a good example. That's what they've done. And they've done it successfully, and they're continuing to do that. So like I said, the measures were there to reduce credit in the economy, but now they're really going after this. They're going to look at uh, property market financing as well, which is also in a bubble. Uh, they're going after that. We know what they've done in terms of curbing uh, investment from outside of China to other countries. They're being very careful. Bank is a good example. So um, we're, we're going to be seeing more examples of this. All right. Thank you, as always. Sarah Honohatopolo there, CGTN's Global Economics Analyst and Berry CEO.